We are honored. This has been a dream interview that I have wanted to do ever since the show started. And I, 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 I don't know if he knows to come over here. But, okay. but Tony Baxter, I have met him several times at the Walt Disney Family Museum. He has agreed to be on Connecting with Walt every single time and has written down his email address. I made the mistake of not looking at it before I walked away. And when I got home, I looked at his email address and thought, what language did Mr. Baxter write his email Yay. address in? Because I can't read it. And that is why you've never received any information yeah. from me. So before you go today, <laughs> yes. I'm writing it down. <laughs> anyway. I was going to be a pharmacist before I became a pharmacist. <laughs> or a surgeon yeah. or something like that. Yeah. So we have two what I think are arguably the greatest artists, storytellers, um, designers, <laughs> In mm -hmm. theme park to entertainment today. Amen. And that's Tony Baxter and Jason Sorrell. Probably read Jason's books if you're a real Disney fan. Mm -hmm. So welcome to the Disney Unplugged. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. If I sit like this, it's because I was on a uh, Delta flight yesterday in uh, the back of the bus. <laughs> oh, gosh. And it was Flying is such a pleasant experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Especially today, Simply wearing delightful. the mask cross country. Yeah. But now we, we hear themed entertainment. And we thought, okay, what does that mean? What is themed entertainment? Well, that's a million dollar question. No, <laughs> Thank you. I think it's, you know, it's putting people in a, a, a universe, if you want to call it that, uh, that is vastly different from the one that we uh, encounter day in and day out. Um, so I think that's why Christmas as a, a whole thing that envelops and becomes immersive now uh, for two or three weeks or a month or two months now and where the whole world sort of changes and has a different look to it and we feel better in that. I remember when the Olympics came to LA and uh, John Jurdy who designed it said it's going to be like a flower that blooms for two weeks and then fades and, and goes away. And uh, if ever a, an architectural thing could be exactly as he described it, I think that was. But the neat thing about the theme parks, it took something that was a phenomena that grew out of Hollywood, the back lot, that uh, people like Walt were familiar with and all the people that worked with, with the early Disneyland, uh, they built these sets. And I, I was watching a new issue of the movie Showboat that came out. And MGM had a, a great thing at the end of all their big movies. It said, the end, an MGM production filmed in Hollywood, USA. And I think the reason, you know, California became overrun with, you know, uh, population is that everyone would look like something that, like that with the Mississippi River and all these wonderful places. So I really was playing around with Showboat and then thinking about, I'm going to watch this movie. And I've got some still frames now of like the boat, some island rafts like Tom Sawyer, mm -hmm. the little village that's right where Rainbow Ridge is in Disneyland, and the island across the way that is about shown about two or three times in that movie. That was 1951, and I think Walt Disney, they were all friends, all the studios, so I'm sure... They probably said, you know, you got to come over here. We've got a steamboat running down the Mississippi River, and, and uh, we've built all this. And it's so obvious that Walt looked at that and thought, probably, you know, we could build a real place like this, not just something where we put the camera out there and film it for a day, and then it lives forevermore on celluloid. But what if we built the Mississippi River, not in Culver City, but in Anaheim, you know? And I think there was confidence in what was done temporarily on the back lots that um, gave them the ability to think we take the same craftspeople and instead of making it out of staff, which is why we, we still to this day call our shops at Disney the staff shop. Uh, it was a material made out of really crummy plaster and, and hay that would disintegrate in like six months. And uh, we'll, we won't use that, we'll use fine building materials, but we'll make it look exactly the same way. So when you look at something like Galaxy's Edge, you're looking at something that is done essentially the same way as those films back in the 30s and the 40s were done, but it will last essentially for as long as we keep it up, it's gonna stay there. So I think it was born out of that, that here is this thing that we let people enjoy as a themed environment on film, 
why, when everybody walks over through the studio and they see the boat coming down the river, uh, you go, why can't people come to see this? I had that experience when they filmed the movie Hello, Dolly, which is like Main Street gigantic. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were casting everybody in the theater departments in all, all of LA because they, they hired all the extras that were available to be in it. And the unions allow them to go to schools so I went, well, what the heck? You get to go on the, the 20th Century Fox backlot. And there was this street and the Harmonia Gardens restaurant and the train going down the track up on this elevated railway. And it was every bit of it looked as beautiful as Main Street at Disneyland. I said, this is truly amazing. This needs to be saved. This needs to be a place that you can come to. So I'm sure that go back 20 years before I was doing that as a young uh, student, and Walt Disney was engaged in that environment of Hollywood. And it's not that far of a leap to figure, how do we take this out of a one-time only use and bring it into a place where people can enjoy it for as long as uh, we want to keep it around? And, and then it's a matter of thinking, what are the themes of this themed entertainment that are really attractive to people? And for Walt Disney, I think we always think of our childhood being the most precious and wonderful thing. So Walt Disney was a child at the time of Main Street. And so all the movies like Hello, Dolly! and things were made by people like Gene Kelly that were you know, uh, peers of Walt Disney at that time and reflect their love affair of their childhood. So there's a lot of that. You see George Lucas building or doing American Graffiti that reflected his childhood uh, you know, in Modesto. So I think we're all bringing kind of our baggage along of places that we love that are nostalgic to us as uh, whatever time frame we were built into. And then there's the evergreens that are just fascinating for people. Uh, and then once in a while, you get to do something that's off the deep end, like a journey into imagination, that's a themed entertainment for a place that doesn't exist. You know, mm -hmm. And I think, in a way, those are the most challenging. And if they work, and I'm not talking about the ride that's there now, I'm talking about the ride that we built in 1982, um, if they work really well, then that's the most pleasing because it was the hardest. You, you don't have a, a book you can go to and look at great architecture or anything like that. And but Jason, I, you referred to theme entertainment as the art of reassurance. And what do you mean by that? Uh, Tony touched on it a little bit. Uh, and I think you see it uh, in, in many of the parks that are now decades and decades old. And uh, there there is something inherently reassuring about being able to return to a place again and again and again that provides that escape and that comfort. And that's inherently reassuring. And, uh, you know, uh, years ago, there was that architectural exhibit called The Architecture of Reassurance. Mm -hmm. And my talk today was called The Art of Reassurance, because it's something that I very much believe in, in terms of what themed entertainment does. And, you know, to Tony's point, what, what Walt wanted to do with Disneyland was allow his audience the chance to step into the movie and not passively observe it, but mm -hmm. live it. And that really gave birth to the entire industry that we know today. I mean, I see it at work every day when kids and adults alike in heavy woolen robes, you know, step into yeah. Diagon Alley and, and their eyes well up with tears. It's because we're offering them as an industry the, the chance to escape from their everyday lives and really live their dreams, their adventures and fantasies in, in ways and places that they can't anywhere else, you know, on the planet. And that's really what I think the industry is all about. And that's what separates a theme park from an amusement park. You know, you can go to a Six Flags, you can go to a Cedar Point, and that's great. There's nothing wrong with them. But, the, the, you know, they're, you're going to have your iron rides, your flume rides, your, you know, your typical amusement park fare. But if you go to a theme park, you're, you're going to escape, to live out a story. I think you're, what he just said about Harry Potter, the generations from 2000 on that passed through that phenomena, uh, it is every bit as strong, if not stronger, than what Walt's uh, generation found for the Main Street that is the entryway to Disneyland. Because if you imagine when Disneyland opened, someone who was 55 years old, like Walt was, walking down that street and reconnecting with a, a world of America that was gone. Well, these kids, and I've seen them too, as they walk in there, they look into this and they say, I never dreamed that I would ever, ever be able to experience this 
place, you know, that's really, really here. Well, that's so. interesting because you would think that for people that never lived in that era, it would be something that wouldn't resonate with them, and yet it still does. It does for various reasons because I think there's a nostalgia now for Main Street, 1955, mm -hmm. that is kind of grafted onto all of us. That if we went there when we were, in my case, six, okay, uh, there's never not been that, and there's a comfort in returning back to it, as you just said of walking in there and knowing that this wonderful experience that I've, it's always been there for me when I go through that archway. Um, you know, so it, it has a, not the reality of it being 1900. That is irrelevant to me. It has a relevance to being 1955. And it's established its yeah. own relevance. Yeah. It, it, it yeah. transcended its origins mm -hmm. to become a thing unto itself. Because I know I feel that way when I, when I go into a park and I, I see that same long shot and that feeling I get, and again, this is why I keep coming back to it, it's inherently reassuring. There, you know, the other thing that both Potter and Main Street have is a richness in every detail of what you see that isn't common to what we live in today. Mm -hmm. So I think that, and again, when I went through the Hello Dolly sets at, at uh, uh, Fox, um, to walk amongst that and say, we don't have this in the real world. We do not get to experience this. And so there's a joy in that of, uh, it probably exceeds, it, it, it certainly exceeds the price that it costs to get you in because everybody is willing to pay that price to have that euphoric uh, relationship with a themed experience, so. And, and did the tune go through your head as you walked down those sets? Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, we put it on, it, it actually, the Hello Dolly score is on Main Street at Disneyland yes. mm -hmm. because, you know, I said, we, we shouldn't limit just to the Victorian tunes from Disney. Anything that's out there that gives you that send back to the nostalgia for what you're trying to uh, create. And there's nothing better than put on your Sunday clothes mm -hmm. uh, to walk down Main Street and, and feel like you're a part of not just that movie, but there's a million like uh, Easter Parade, a lot of yeah. films that uh, showboat itself walking through Disneyland. I always thought we could film showboat at Disneyland. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, it's a thing that's kind of evolved out of Hollywood and there's no, uh, what would I call it? It's not a happenstance that Universal and Disney are the two companies that are at the lead of doing this because they had the strong background in, in bringing it to another media first and now into real life. Now, you started out at Disneyland as an ice cream scooper. Mm -hmm. So what was Walt's favorite flavor? Oh. Well, he never... He never came through to eat. I ice believe cream. it was scotch. Yeah, right. <laughs> See, that's why I had him on the show today. I, I can be dead as a door, uh, you know, deadly dull, and uh, he made a lot of. Fun. Oh, so Walt didn't come in. For oh yeah, ice he cream. came in, uh, and we would. I remember they would say, "You've got to keep all the windows open. Don't go on breaks or anything," until he's cleared. And it kind of bothered me that he should know that we don't have enough people to normally eat, open all the windows and all that. And, uh, but then when he came around and he was very pleasant, he, uh, you know, three or four times you'd feel a tap on the back of your shoulder and he'd say, how are you all doing today? And then he'd keep on a pace. So you never had any time to, oh, Mr. D you know, that mm -hmm. was not in the cards, but that day I decided, uh, when he came through Carnation that I was going to tell him that they don't hire enough people to keep the windows open. Uh -huh. And of course, when he came around and I was scooping and he said, well, how's everything going here today? And I go, just fine. You know, like that was about all that, that was it. You know, and I go, there it was, my chance, and I blew it, you know, so. And it's funny thing is Walt would have been upset if he had heard things were being staged oh, yeah. for but him. But you'd have been fired if they yeah. knew that you said that. <laughs> yeah. You know, so. yeah. Well, Michael Eisner would very famously, when he would come down here and, and tour the parks, he would do the, the staged walk, but then he had the smarts to go back afterwards and say, okay, now I want to go by myself with one other person and see what's really going mm -hmm. on. You know, because they know that it's all, you know, set up for that. For that no, process. I remember when we were finishing up Disneyland Paris that Jeffrey Katzenberg called me and said, could you meet me at the park tonight in Paris at midnight? And I go, at midnight? And he goes, yeah, I want to walk just with you and, and hear what your comments are about it. And this was right after Beauty and the Beast was, um, you know, coming into the theaters. And the, Jeffrey was a very proud person, and I like him a lot. But he said, and it's sort of a compliment, he goes, well, you know, there's three things that I can 
tell you, Walt would have been pleased with Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, and Disneyland Paris. <laughs> you know, what so a compliment. Yeah, it was, you know, so. And he was right. I think he was right. I, I felt those two films, when they came out, were right up there with our original uh, motion pictures. It was such a euphoric time to realize we were now back and doing not Walt Disney Productions, but doing Walt Disney. You mm -hmm. know, it was definitely the came back and we were we had our witty banter before this segment um and we were talking about disneyland paris and how i i believe it's one of the most beautiful it's the most beautiful park of the disney theme parks but i also talked about there's a there's a spirit that disneyland has that it's an this is it's an intangible spirit that not all the other parts have. I don't know if it's the spirit of Walt, if it's the intimacy, mm -hmm. and when you were designing Disneyland Paris, how much was that feeling? I'm carrying on Walt's legacy and vision, a part of what you created because you 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 clearly made you made some differences in that park. You just didn't do a carbon copy like Tokyo Disneyland. So how much went into that? How much of that was sort of hanging over your head? Oh, well, it was huge. And Tom, I think, is floating around here. He had Fantasyland. We had five people, one on each land, who had grown up with Disneyland. And Tom was here on opening day as a 12-year-old who saved his paper route money to fly down alone on the plane and have to fly back that night to California. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're talking so, about Tam, um, Tom Nabby. No, Morris. Morris. Oh, Morris. Morris. I'm yeah. sorry. Oh, no. He's, he's right back yeah, there. You right can see there. him. Tom he's he's waving. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Wave All the time. There he so, is. Anyway, uh, but the, you know, those are the kind of people that were on that crew. They were people that had the DNA of Disneyland in their blood. And Eddie Sato, who could who grew up on, we, he was a gen, uh, 10 years younger than me, but we found out we both were absolutely fascinated with Hello, Dolly. So we put Eddie on Main Street. I said, he has such a phenomenal understanding of what John DeCure created in the movie Hello, Dolly, that we can give him this new Main Street, and it's going to be the most beautiful Main Street, and it is, that we ever did. And Tom's castle had to stand up against all of the castles in Europe, not in a competing way, but in a complementary way, and it does. And so the, the thing that came through from Disneyland specifically, being more charming, uh, is that it was built before and by people that didn't know how to do theme parks. Mm -hmm. Every other theme park has been done by people that know this as a product, and we know how to do it, and we know what capacity is, um, and all the things that guide you into making widths of wall walkways and, and queues and, and flowing in and out of vehicles and stuff. That's all a science now. It wasn't when they built Disneyland. And so you get things in there that are charming, that are naive, that are the things that make it very special. So our talent, challenge on doing Paris was, how do we make it accommodate a large crowd like today, but do it in a way that looks like Disneyland, rather than accommodating? So it means two 20-foot walkways instead of one 40-foot wide walkway. Mm -hmm. It means arcades on the back of Main Street instead of covering it like they did in Tokyo which makes it so you can, in the snow, you can walk on Main Street. But in Paris, they love the sunshine when they get it, which is very seldom. And to cover it would have uh, been against the kind of the culture of the people that, are, that live there. Mm -hmm. And so the arcades do the same thing, but they're only used really when they need it, rather than having the beauty of the sunshine and the playfulness of the architecture. Um, the, you know, so we went through the whole park in finding ways to reinvest the Disneyland aesthetic, but with the demands of a industrialized mm -hmm. project, like a theme park. But, so I, I ended up saying, here's how we're gonna distinguish the three types of parks. Disneyland is charming, Walt Disney World is spectacular, mm -hmm. and Paris is beautiful. So, mm -hmm. and I think they, they, they do work that way. Absolutely. Now, Jason, at Universal, Universal Creative, you have, a burden of Universal has created some blockbuster films that are series and series of films that that your guests are very heavily invested in. They go in with preconceived notions of these attractions because they because of the love they have for the Jurassic Park and Jurassic World, which is the Harry Potter series. What is that like to meet 
expectations of guests to create attractions based around these beloved franchises. It's interesting because that's that's something that we actually take very seriously because, you know, in our business, uh, we are largely a business of adaptation now where where we're taking a beloved property, whether it's a film, a book, uh, and translating it into a livable experience, you know, like we were talking about earlier. And that is something that that weighs heavily on you because you don't want to be the one to drop the ball on that. And, you know, using Harry Potter as an example, that was a really interesting one because obviously the the books stand on their own as an absolute beloved classic. And yet it's the only thing I can think of where the, the books and the films that were adapted from them are so heavily intertwined that we were almost compelled to realize the world, the wizarding world of Harry Potter as, as it's seen in the films in our parks because there was that strong a connection between audience mm-hmm. and, and the source material. And you know, we, we partner with, uh, with Warner Brothers, the studio that uh, released the films, and, and J.K. Rowling herself. And uh, you know, the, the, it's, it's a, an incredible honor and responsibility to, to create those environments for real so that people can actually interact and live out the fantasies that they've had in many cases since they were a little kid, you know, reading the books. And then um, I just worked on uh, Universal Studios Beijing, which is currently in soft opening. And uh, one of my pride and joys from that project is Jurassic World Adventure. And it was the same thing. It's like, we want to put people in that film and and create that same sense of fear and excitement. You know, we have a moment where the Indominus Rex chases the ride vehicle for 10 seconds. That's a long time when you're being pursued by a giant dinosaur. But it all came out of a, a meeting one day when we're all like, I want to be Jeff Goldblum in the back of that Jeep going, must go faster. You know, now you can experience that. And when you're dealing with properties that are beloved, which is certainly the case at Universal and it's the case at Disney, uh, it, it's something that that a lot of us as storytellers take very seriously because you're following in the footsteps of giants in, in many cases, J.K. Rowling, Steven Spielberg, Walt Disney, George Lucas. Uh, and it's it's really an honor and a privilege to get to play in that sandbox. And 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 I, like Tony, have have had the privilege of of working with some pretty beloved properties and characters. And to me, that's a big part of the fun of what I do. You know, because sometimes it's like, well, what about original storytelling? You wouldn't you want to come up with an original storyline for a ride? And it's like, my answer to that has always been yes, ish, because <laughs> there ish. It, it almost can't compare like it to to what i get to do you know working with dinosaurs and transformers and 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 harry potter it's 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 an honor you know and it's something we all take very seriously so since you create these experiences when you visit the parks it's very different from when we visit the parks can you just go in and say i'm just going to enjoy today or are you looking at everything with like a critical eye, a storyteller's eyes, an engineer's eyes, a designer's eye? I, I find for myself, I look at my own stuff more critically. Um, one of the greatest things to happen to me as a Disney fan was to go work for Universal because now I can go to Disneyland or Walt Disney World and just enjoy it as a guest, especially as someone who had kids later in life, just to have that you know, I don't think about how the sausage is made anymore. I'm just going and enjoying it with with my kids. Um, But I do think as artists, we tend to be more critical of our own work. But uh, at the same time, once you establish yourself in an industry like this, you also can't not think about it like, oh, they should have made that walkway wider, you know, or, oh, this was built full scale and it would have been more you charming. Know, charming if they'd done it with forced perspective. I think, you know, to your point about Disneyland, I think one of the reasons it's retained its charm is because everything is forced perspective and almost feels like you're walking into an oversized toy as opposed to a place you would find in the so-called real world. And I think that contributes to the illusion. Mm-hmm. Unless Tony disagrees. <laughs> no, you said no. it all. I'm trying to think what else is. No, well, I no, because I think you've brought it up. Like, is a difference yeah. between Disneyland and Magic Kingdom? I Magic Kingdom is bigger. Yes, it's spectacular, and Disneyland's charming. But you know, the I think I remember Claude Coates, who was a great uh, background artist, and 
and did the pirate uh, city and created the 20,000 leagues ride and all this stuff. And I said, what, what do you, I asked the same question. What do you think? He goes, well, I have a problem with it because I always go on the rides and I see things that they're not maintaining at the level that I left it when, I, when we opened or whatever. And they've modified things to get more people through or whatever they might have done. And, and so he was caught up in that. I, I think what you said about switching from Disney to Universal, I have thoroughly enjoyed going through Harry Potter and all that because uh, I don't have the baggage of like, what, oh, look up there, you can see the, where the screen ends or whatever and all this stuff. <laughs> Uh, whereas I, you know, when you when you're in a building that you saw under work lights for a year, and then they turn the lights out and it's a show, you go, oh well, there's still the thing, and because you you know where it all is, but when you come into experiences that you've never seen before, um, I, and we've all had that when we first went on the Peter Pan ride, and the building at, at least at Disneyland is hardly any different size wise than a house that you live in. It's so it's all done again, with amazing force perspective and things. And when I was six and I came home and I was trying to describe it to my grandmother what I had seen in there, I mean, there was no way in my brain was the size of a footprint of a normal house. It was, you know, we went on this journey and we went to Neverland and we fell down at the island when they shot at us and all this I didn't know about, mechanical tracks and the ceiling and all the, the, the stuff that tends to but it, it is fun to explore places you've not, you know, had anything to do with. And so when I came down here for Pandora, I had not any information. I kind of knew in the back of my mind mm -hmm. uh, what they were going to do. But it was all brand new to me. So going through the queue that seemed like it was never going to be over, there was just more and more and more and more. And it was all really neat, you know, and to see. And you go, how did they, you know, I don't know how they even afford it to put all that in. But that was fun for me because I'd been out of the loop on that one. So, And sometimes you know. even when you know how something is done, I keep thinking back to the 90s when I was directing the Bill and Ted show for Halloween Horror Nights. The, the arena that it took place in was right next to Jaws. And our rehearsals were always late at night. So around midnight, you know, we took a break and we're all like, oh, we're going to go next door and watch them bring the sharks out of the water. <laughs> so, it, so like a bunch of nerds, we would go over and we would go into the boathouse and it, as these mechanical sharks would get raised out of the water, and I would literally shrink back from the water and press myself up against the wall, not even knowing I was doing it. And my friends would look at me and go, what are you doing? I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, I, I, I'm scared. And they're like, it's a mechanical fiberglass shark. What's the matter with you? But the imagery was so powerful. You know, and even when I would ride that ride as an adult, going into that boathouse, I hated being on the right-hand side when the shark came out of the water because in that moment, I was a kid again who was terrified by that movie. Again, it's a testament to the power of, of some of these storytellers, these filmmakers, the, this imagery, these uh, moments that we bring to life for people, and, and, and you can create it for real. I mean, I'm, I'm more scared of that mechanical shark than if I went into the ocean and, and encountered a real one, which I would rather not do. No, yeah. Let's make that clear. I think Walt was aware of the dichotomy between what we see on stage when we go as a guest and then the enjoyment and curiosity that people have for behind the scenes because the programs on his show that literally riveted me where then he showed you how the tiki room was made or that hand that was laying on a table that you, you it's probably all burned into your mind where there was a hand with wires coming out of it and it was all going like this that was stuff just fascinated me and you'd think well he's kind of showing the the back side of it you know but i think he realized that that would make even more fascination one of our things we do in california for i think it's adventures by disney um, when they go behind the scenes at disneyland which gives them a reason to take our tours rather than other competing southern california tours um, they go into the indiana jones ride and they're all given a chance to program the ride vehicle that makes it buck and 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 uh, that I think is one of the elements of that whole tour that people tell me is just oh we got to go back there and we they let us move all the levers and make the thing react so yes there's an excitement to being in the ride and wondering that this is all really happening to me and it's very effective at conveying that when you're on the ride but then there's also a joy about wow it's like getting to see how the magic was made so we're always kind of 
you know, going, should we or shouldn't we? But I think there's a joy and entertainment value in both sides of it. We've talked on connecting this with how, you know, Walt made infomercials before anybody knew what they were. Yeah. I mean, who else and won Emmys could have them. won an <laughs> Emmy Award for a television yeah. show that did nothing but promote his movie 20,000 yeah. Leagues Under yeah. the Sea? Yeah. I mean, it was amazing. And the name Disneyland, which is a TV show, and a year before Disneyland, with a four uh, uh, venues for uh, shows on it of Tomorrowland and Adventureland, mm -hmm. that put into every six-year-old's brain the architectural logic of Disneyland and what one could expect to find. And it was drummed in every Wednesday night when the show debuted. And I, when, I, when we got there finally a year later, I knew where to run. I knew where it all was. You know, I knew because it was just part of my uh, you know, education. It was probably the most important part of my education was that one hour Disneyland show. Yeah. Now, before our segment, we were talking about um, Epcot and journey into imagination. And we, the interesting thing about the Journey and Imagination Pavilion is that we, um, it's the only one not grounded in reality mm -hmm. out of all the pavilions. So how did that come about? It's no longer grounded in entertainment either. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, well, it was actually Kodak that came to mm -hmm. us and... Uh, we were trying to, we had a, a, a sales room in New York City to sell the Epcot pavilions. Mm -hmm. And they had come through and they said, well, we don't really see anything that matches us. And I remember that they were brought out to California and, and they said, get the Seas Pavilion and get, um, I forget which other one, it might have been Energy, um, ready so they can see it, or Horizons, maybe it was Horizons. And they said, well, this, we do not see ourselves in that way. We see ourselves as a company that allows people to express their imagination. And we, through our cameras, allow everyone to be an artist. Uh, and so isn't there something about that that, and the more we got into it, we realized that nothing, whether it's uh, the world of science and technology or it's the arts or the skills of you know maintaining the land or the seas, it all requires human imagination before you can get to that. And I remember we had a silly thing where we said, the process you do to make a birthday cake for your child is the same as making an atomic bomb in terms of gathering the input like you all are doing and then storing it some way like he's doing with his camera and, uh, and then recombining what you learned here into something new if you, if you got something out of this that sparked an idea for you. So gather, combine, and uh, gather, store, gather, store, and recombine became the Genesis, and then the Shermans came on board to write one little spark out of, we fed them that message, and uh, they came back with um, a, a beautiful song that's uh, an earworm, as they call it, uh, and, uh, and, and it just sort of fed on it, and it's funny, when you invent characters like Figment and Dreamfinder, you start to understand what they would or not do. And I remember we sit in meetings and, and someone would say, well, Figment could be, and you go, no, Figment can't do that. Figment wouldn't do that. He's a four-year-old. He has a tension span of like two minutes and he's got to be on to the next thing and doing this and doing that. Oh, okay. And then Dreamfinder gave the counterpart to that where he's learned, a scholar, a Santa Claus, if you will. And so the more you developed it, the more you understood your characters because uh, we were saying in the last session that when you come away from a film or something that changes your life, an attraction, it's not so much the events along the journey as it is the characters that guided you through. And so when we think of The Wizard of Oz, there's a lot of places they went in that movie, but we think of Dorothy and we think of the Tin Man and the Scarecrow. And um, that's, you know, so I think the reason Figment and Dreamfinder, even and Dreamfinder has not been around for a long time, they still live in so many of your memories because of what an impression they made on you emotionally when okay, you first Okay, can I can I ask oh, absolutely as the, as I the was ultimate defer to you. <laughs> we knew this would happen. Yes, yes I, that's I why have, I brought it up. I can't have you sitting at the table. I am like the ultimate figment absolutely. fan. Um, it it captured me at Disney like no other character ever has. But and it and it's, you know, we we know it's not as good as the original. Mm -hmm. It's better than the second. 
in my world, it's like it's better than nothing. But but we don't a, settle for that. Well, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm just I'm just glad it's there because okay. I would hate. I'm just relieved I don't work at Disney anymore because <laughs> this would be a problem. <laughs> you know, I just I, I I love the ride. My um, granddaughter was afraid to ride it, and. You know, we got to bond. I got to show her. I have figment footprints up on my wall. And uh -huh. when my grandkids come, I move the, the feet around. So figment lives at my house. Not that I'm geeky or anything. But <laughs> now we know it, where he went. <laughs> yes. But is there any chance that they're ever going to give them a better story or a better... I, I think there is. And it's really a testament to all of you that have kept him alive, that he's part of the art uh, at Epcot program. He's part of the wine and, and wine festival and food festivals and all that, that it's clearly recognized that he's a mascot that is in, in some ways stronger at Epcot than Mickey uh, because he represents the important first step in, in moving into the future or going into world cultures and all that. He is kind of a bond about that, that it, it isn't Mickey's territory. Mickey is the guy next door, uh, that your neighbor. Um, but Figment is this impish little character that, what's next? Where are we going next? What's going to be the new surprise around the corner? And I think that it's weird how when we didn't have a name for it, it was just the dragon. And you've all heard my story about watching Magnum, P Magnum P.I. and there was a, a goat in their garden. and. Um, the old butler was mad because all the, you know, the, the plants were being torn up. And Magnum says, oh, oh, Higgins, it's just a figment of your imagination. And then Higgins, in his scornful way, said, figments don't eat grass. And I remember, well, what do they eat? You know, what do they eat? And I suddenly went, everyone in the world knows this word, everybody that speaks English anyway. And we all use it to describe, oh, it's just a f something weird and strange and odd and different, but we've never seen it. And so that I could hardly wait to get to work that day. I grabbed the model and I said, meet Figment. This is mm. who. And when everyone heard that name when looking at it, you know, they said, how do we not think of it? You know, and I wouldn't have thought of it. I just was watching TV. And now the interesting thing is when you go to your phones and you type in Figment and then go to images, Google images, every single image that will come up you can scroll and scroll as figment. And you go, that's mental real estate that was free. You know, it was, it was a word that was there, it was free. And we just said, okay, that's, that's the word and this is what that looks like, connected them. And now it's made a mental uh, image out of something that had no image. It was ripe for giving it this visual visualization because now we know what it looks like and it's a thing and it's precious and it's care it's something we care about so uh, it was one of those fortunate things and when I do lectures at colleges I talk to them that there's there's no limit to the available mental real estate that hasn't been claimed that's for free it's all out there and it's just having either the opportune moment where two things collide, a need and an opportunity, and you've created something that's not physical, you know, uh, real estate in the way we think about land, but it's mental real estate that connects uh, something together that becomes, um, and, and we do it all the time, I mean, words like space mountain. What is that? A space and a mountain, but you put them together, and all of you in your mind see a picture right now that's mm -hmm. very distinct. So, you know, um, we can all be masters of that and find these wonderful opportunities that are available. <laughs> Meanwhile, Tom Selleck's consulting a copyright lawyer. So. <laughs> right. Bless his heart. Now, now, I know you are the creative consultant on the re-theming of Splash Mountain. I just want to put a little, little thought in your head. If you want to see Disneylanders go crazy, you have to have a scene with the country bears singing in the bayou. Oh. <laughs> well, people have to go on our Winnie the Pooh ride out there to see country bears singing. And those of you that know the little, you know, hidden gag in the Pooh ride in California. So, uh, now, just, that was a terrible thing, by the way. And I, I need to give get myself off the hook here. Oh, sure. We were told, you know, like you did here, take out the toad ride and put in Winnie the Pooh. And I said, if I take out the toad ride at Disneyland, which was better than the one here, 
then there will be no toad rides anywhere in the entire Disney universe. Whereas if we go somewhere else and we've gotten Critter Country going with Splash, and so it's got little characters of animals that come to life and talk. And I thought, well, the Pooh characters are close to that. I said, if we can do that, there'll still be a bear band here and we'll still have a toad ride there. And so many of you go to all the parks um, that I think there's a pleasure in knowing that Mystery Manor will be there if you go to Tokyo, uh, Hong Kong and the wonderful Winnie the Pooh ride that's in, mm -hmm. in Tokyo, Disneyland. And there's a, a charm about it. And then I can come here and see Country Bear Jamboree. There are a, a real importance to being able to go to the different parks and seeing different things. So I defend myself on that. But boy, you talk about angry people of mm. getting rid of Country Bear and uh, and keeping uh, the, the, the little toad ride. But uh, the toad ride was done by my mentor, Claude Coates. And I don't know how Walt approved that the ending of the ride would have you committing all these uh, atrocities driving helter skelter through London and for that you go to hell uh, you know but that was what was there and I said it is so outrageously audacious that it's got to stay <laughs> it's got to be a part of Disneyland so, and it's interesting because the other um, dark ride attractions are sort of a basic retelling of the story Mr. Toad was the one that took you on a completely different adventure you, with the same character it's you and see to me it's really important with a lot of especially thrill rides and I kind of characterize the toad ride as more thrill than it is expo exposition you know because um, you're out of control you're banging through crates and barrels are falling and you're arrested and it's all about you doing these things mm -hmm. and so uh, I am very glad that we kept that because I love the, the rides like it's a small world where you're enjoying a journey through something. But on the other hand, these things that give you a chance to do something you can't do in your normal life. And let's face it, none of us have been to hell yet. So uh, <laughs> at Disneyland, you can do that. You, know? you can be run yeah. over by a train and end up, you know, hey, we didn't come up with it. It was there when I was six years old and it you know, burned into my mind. I went, wow, what is that? And I've got, I got the movie because I'd never seen that movie. You know, it's not a feature film, it's a short. And so, uh, you know, uh, but anyway, I, I admit that I, I saved that and, you know, it, there's no really great uh, solutions to saying goodbye to something, but we can still do the bear band either here or in Tokyo. And we can still do the, the Walt's original, you know, um, Toad, Mr. Toad's Wild Ride at Disneyland. So. Yeah, and in Tokyo you can see all three versions yes. of the country. Yes, yeah, that's which right. Is nice. And speaking of attractions, Jason, you wrote some of the definitive books mm -hmm. on the Disneyland attract on Disney attractions. Talk a little about those. What um, inspired you to write those books? Uh, the main impetus for the books was that I wanted to read them, you know, <laughs> and they didn't exist. And, and I remember it was the summer of 2002 when we knew the Haunted Mansion movie was coming the next year and Pirates as well. And I remember sticking my head into the, my vice president's office at, at Imagineering here in Florida. And I said, who do we talk to about doing a book? And he goes, I don't know, email Marty. You know, so I emailed Marty and I said, hey, I, you know, we've got the Haunted Mansion movie coming out next year. I think it would be a good excuse to do uh, like a marketing tie in where it's about the making of the movie, air quotes, but we're really telling the story of the attraction. He goes, oh, that's a great idea. Write me a book proposal. And I'm like, great. How do I do that? You know, because I'd never done it before. So I essentially just outlined the book the way I would write a treatment for an attraction. And then he worked with me on it a little bit back and forth. And then he said, okay, now write a proposal letter to the publishing division in New York. And I'm like, great. What does that need to look like? You know, I had no idea. So I essentially just wrote a memo or a, a, a letter that would be like a pitch that you would do for an attraction, sent that to him. And then next thing I knew, he said, okay, I sent the whole thing to, to Disney editions in New York. We'll wait and see. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then about a month later, I got a call from, uh, from Wendy Lefkin, the, the head of Disney editions. And she said, uh, we love it. We want to do it. We're going to take it to our sales and acquisition meeting on Wednesday, you know, to see if the parks will carry it, you know, because they were trying to work out 
the economic model, because they at that time it was felt like if the parks didn't support it, that there wouldn't be a market for it. So that Wednesday, I was just sitting at home, like waiting with bated breath. And then that night, the the woman who would, would become my editor, Jody Revinson, called, and she goes, "The good news is uh, we're doing the book. The bad news is to bring it out with the movie, we need the manuscript in January." And this was like. October. And I'm like, oh, I, I said, well, you know, and I had no idea what it was going to take. Uh, but uh, what wound up happening was that was how I spent my Christmas vacation, you know, so I did all of my, my research, my interviews, went to the archives. And then, uh, as it turned out, I did have a little bit of extra time because the movie didn't even go into principal photography into, in, uh, until January. So they sent me out, spent two weeks on set with, with the filmmakers, embedded with the movie, and uh, took a, a month or two to write that part of it, turned in that manuscript, and uh, it, it was done by August. And then the movie came out in, in November, so we made it. Um, and it was funny because I pitched Pirates at the same time as Haunted Mansion. And, at, and again, this is 2002. And my editor was like, nah, nah, we're not interested. I'm like, why? And she's like, because all of our Bruckheimer books go right in the toilet. You know, because they had done Armageddon and uh, Pearl Harbor. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> I said, I, well, I think this one might, might be a little different. Nah, no, no, not interested. <laughs> Pass. <laughs> so then, of course, summer of 2003 rolls around. And it was right when the movie was passing $300 million at the box office. I get a phone call going, you know, we're really kind of disappointed that we didn't do a Pirates book. And I go, well, that's interesting, because I seem to recall having this very same conversation about a year ago. <laughs> Uh, and that was how the the pirates book came out. It was just a, a little bit later because uh, they didn't realize, you know, what a what a juggernaut it was going to become. And then the mountains followed that. And, and instead of being uh, one single attraction, you know, we just tackled the mountains as a whole. And Tony actually provided uh, the the afterword for for that book uh, because of Big Thunder Mountain and Splash Mountain and his contributions to the Disney Mountain Range. Yeah, yeah. but it's all because I wanted to read them. Yeah. And, and, and they didn't exist. Well, I think we would all like to see them updated and reissued. <laughs> well, I think you should address your emails and letters to Wendy Lefkin in New York. There you go. Because I, I would down. at least love to see them as as ebooks, only yeah. because I get questions all all the yeah. time in terms yeah. of you know I, I don't want to pay three hundred dollars on eBay, which is absurd, by the way. Um, but yeah, I, I would love to see them back too. Mansion's still out there though. Now, now, you are um, all storytellers, both of you are storytellers, and Walt Disney said he wanted to be remembered as a storyteller. So now when we go into your parks and we see what you have created and, and when our listeners hear you talk, read your books, how, now that we know what we know, how do you want us to regard you? <laughs> Go ahead. Well, you're the legend, not me. Yeah, they <laughs> the words. I don't. I'm some schmuck from Cleveland who got lucky. Oh. No, I, I, honestly, uh, the there is a, this is gonna sound so pretentious, but it, it's like I relate it to a line. Uh, well, it was Walt Whitman, but for me, it was Dead Poet Society. But you know the. The powerful play goes on and, and you may contribute a verse or however it is. That is honestly how I've looked at, at my career it is I just being incredibly fortunate that, you know, and I've spent my career working for the two giants in the industry, you know, Disney and Universal, and I've had amazing experiences at both. Um, and just to, to have had an opportunity to work with some of the characters that I've worked with. Not people like Tony. I'm talking about like you know, the dinosaurs and so forth. But uh, you know, just uh, being a steward of, of, of some of those characters and stories, and then it, it really occurred to me uh, in the past couple of years. Uh, you know, again, I mentioned having kids a lot later in life. So we would take them to Universal, for example, and they would go see the Day in the Park with Barney show, which I wrote when I was 24. So you have to picture what it was like, and this gets back to reassurance and returning to things that have endured for decades in some cases. And it was really mind blowing to sit watching the Barney show. And one moment I'm literally having a flashback to when I, uh, I would literally remember writing a certain line of dialogue or deciding this song would go well here. And then in the next moment, I'm looking down at my kids singing and dancing and clapping along to the show. And that was absolutely surreal. And that's what we get what we're privileged to do. We're, we're able to somehow contribute to making those moments for people 
that that they'll literally remember forever. So getting to contribute a verse is 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 what I, I would hope I'd be remembered for, if anything. And and being a good husband and father, since my wife is. <laughs> that is I don't know. I would. That's I would. first. Then the then the crap about the powerful play, <laughs> and then. When we were talking about Figment, and I think back to, you know, that moment sitting on the couch watching the TV, and the word Figment popped up on the screen. And I brought it in, and I electrified a whole group of people because I carried that word from my television set to uh, there. And so much of it is like that. It's like John Williams is regarded as one of the greatest composers of all time, Harry Potter, and was it Jurassic? Jurassic. Yeah. And as well as Superman, Jaws. Jaws, and gosh, everything that we have grown up with in the last 30 years. And uh, But he doesn't do it alone. I mean, if the images weren't there on the screen to inspire him and the orchestra didn't have 80 people in there that each do uh, something that he can't do playing each of these instruments, he knows how I can bring that sound together with this sound. I think that's where I, what I found myself falling into as I stopped drawing uh, and, and painting and building models. I realized that my role is one of bringing the right people together uh, so that I could step back and know that Tom Morris and, and Eddie Sato and Tim Delaney, they're going to do such a great job that I can uh, focus on things that are not, uh, you know, going to use up all my time trying to you know, solve these problems. And so it means finding like an orchestra of 80 people that, you know, they come into a room and then John stands up there and then they all play this. How does that happen? That's, yeah. you know, I don't know how that, it's not anything I understand that they don't know one another. They've come from whatever houses and they just un open their instruments and they all start playing beautiful uh, material. And so I think what we do is we're, uh, we're all involved in that and you kind of see the end of it. And some of our names become more known than others but it couldn't possibly happen if you didn't build these incredible linkages with all the opportunities of meeting people and, and bringing them in. And I, I was talking about Michel Danduk, who did the Frozen Ride down here. I found him at a theme park, Efteling, in Holland, which is spectacular. And, um, and my, Michelle is now working with us. And to watch him you know, come from under my wings when we started on the Fantasy Fair. And now he's out doing projects all around the world for Disney. And there's just an excitement in that, in that, uh, you know, Walt Disney did the same for me. And I never met him on a professional basis, but on TV, he shared with me all these things that became the rules that I uh, uh, took under my uh, wings. And then all of his disciples that were there when I got there, tutored me in going forward. So I think that we're all in a continu continuum, you know, that um, offers uh, endless possibilities and depends on a, a corporate artistic whole and not an individual thing. It's literally something that comes out of a, a big conglomerate, you know, that is, uh, the way art has always been pretty much has been a commodity, whether it was for religion in the early times or in commercial enterprise now. But personal art is something very different than the communal art that um, we, we dwell with. It has to work for everybody, and therefore it has to be created by uh, a grand group. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. And, and sharing you know, your, your answers, your expertise with us. And on behalf of our Dis Unplugged family, I would like to thank you for your work in continuing um, Walt and Roy's legacy and for creating magical moments and memories for us and also giving us those sparks of imagination through your work that for us to incorporate into our lives. So ladies and gentlemen, Tony Baxter and, and um, Jason Sorrell, thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much.